Okay. You got it. Oh. Okay, cool. Uh, I apologize for that car outside. <laughs> Can you hear it? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> house car. Okay. Um, cool. All right. So, um, so we are on, we have been, uh, I guess, uh, forget what did I do with you guys, the Song of Songs last time? Or? Yes. Yes. So we are on a journey that I have entitled In the Mother's House. Um, and this is a series that I'm doing uh, on the text which uh, pertain uh, in, in the, uh, to the mother's house. So I want to explain a little bit what I mean by that and why I've chosen to explore that. Um, and I think I did that last time, but I just want to review a little bit. Um, so the, the biblical text for centuries has been associated with patriarchy, right? We have um, male god, male officials priests, male readers of the Bible. Uh, and so we have over the centuries forgotten that in the Hebrew Bible, there is also a very strong female voice. There is also a very strong matriarchal uh, culture. in the Hebrew Bible. And so the goal of this series called The Mother's House is to recover these, uh, these voices, these lost feminine voices that are in the Hebrew Bible that are actually very vocal, that are very present, but somehow we have overlooked them. So um, so that's really the key here is to recover those voices, but not only these voices, I want to recover also the brand of spirituality that comes with the mother. It's a very different way of seeing God. It's a very different way to embody spirituality. And so I'm going to talk about that in a second, um, because there is a clear difference between worshiping in a patriarchal context and worshiping in a matriarchal context. And so I wanna talk about the distinction between the two. But first of all, just what are the texts that belong to the mother's house? Well, you have for sure um, all of the texts of uh, wisdom literature, all of the texts of the writings. So you have all of the books of Solomon, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, uh, Song of Songs, but then you also have um, the texts which feature strong female characters like the book of Ruth, book of Esther. And I'm gonna add uh, the book of Genesis to, to, to that um, wonderful family of books. So these are the texts typically that are read not regularly, only once a year in different uh, festivals. <laughs> and um, but and, and that's why I want to focus on them because they are often I call them the lost and forgotten texts of the Hebrew Bible. So so before I go into you know our text for today, which is going to be Eve, uh, Genesis uh, one to three, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the difference. Re remind us about the difference between the mother's house and the father's house. Um, and again, what I'm trying to do is not, I'm not trying to replace the father's house, <laughs> right? I believe that both houses have a particular teaching that is important. I'm reminded of the Proverbs, which says, you know, listen to your father's teaching and do not forget your mother's uh, teaching, right? So the mother and the father, the, the teachings of both are important, the teachings of the father's house and the teachings of the mother's house, right? So I'm not trying to replace the father's house, but I have uh, distinguished the two as follows. So the father's house is um, a more of um, a doing, right? I call the father's house a temple spirituality, uh, where you are in a way doing for God, right? In fact, the word for worship is the same as the word for work, avoda, right? This is father's house, right? This is a, we are doing, we are sacrificing, where there's rituals, there's commandments, there's sacrifices one has to do. And this is all important, right? All necessary uh, also. Mother's house, I distinguish from temple spirituality. I call it garden spirituality. This is the opposite. This is, it's not, no more us doing for God, but God doing for us, right? So this is, we are receiving from God rather than uh, giving to God. And so that is my view, the main distinction between father's house and mother's house. There's a number of other distinctions. For example, the father's house is more interested in separating from the different nations, from, from otherness. The mother's house is more integrative, more welcoming of otherness. You see this even in the way the books in the mother's house were written. There's a lot of influences from Egypt, even from Canaan, right? So it's a much more inclusive approach to um to the truth. Uh, also, there's a main distinction between a law and wisdom, right? Father's house is centered on the law, on, on very clear uh, 
precepts given to us by God. And Mother's House is, is, is more interested in wisdom, which is not so much coming from the mouth of God, it's coming more from experience, from having lived, from having stumbled around in the world for a while, from having made mistakes, from having transgressed, and little by little you gain wisdom in that way. So, so the Father's House is much more vertical, right? We receive the law from God. The mother's house is much more horizontal. We learn from each other. We learn by entering the world through experience, right? So these are some of the main distinctions, right? If you can enter, if you can um, begin to see. And again, I believe they're to be held together, right? We need both. <laughs> if we just have one, it becomes unbalanced, right? So uh, so that's why it's important in my view to study both. I'm focusing here on the mother's house because it has been neglected. <laughs> so, but I'm not in no way am I trying to replace the father's house with the mother's house. So I want to go back to the main distinction and say a few words about that temple versus garden spirituality. I get a lot of pushbacks. I've taught this text twice already before coming to you guys in different communities. And I always get the same pushback. I've taught it in a Christian and in a Jewish community. And I've, I get the same pushback, which, which shows me how, how steeped we are really in the Father's house. Because what I'm about to talk about is, is about receiving, right? Receiving, grace, and so this is the Mother's house. And I always get the pushback, well, you know, we should do things, right? We can't just wait for God to take care and do everything, right? This is the, the, the pushback I get usually. So... Uh, so this is, the, and it tells me that there is really, it's a hard idea to come to that, to let go and to let God, right? This is not something we're used to. We're used to mastering our destinies. We're used to working hard. We're used to achieving. And so I'm going to invite you in this particular series, or especially today, let's try to, to see things also from that perspective, right? There is a, of course we must do, of course we must achieve, but we will always hit a wall at some point. There is always a moment where you will see the limits of your actions, whether it's with kids, whether it's with husband or wife, whether it's with, you know, students, there's always a point where our actions reaches a limit, right? And, and this is the moment, right, where we can open up grace, right? So, so I'm not saying don't, we're, we're not going to learn here, don't do anything, right? The mother's house is not about doing nothing, but it's about recognizing, and mothers realize this, and perhaps more than fathers with, with their children, that there's only so much I can do for you, <laughs> right? And at one point, I have to let go. The father will continue to beat, you know, the, <laughs> the truth into the child's right. But the mother will realize very quickly, there's only so much I can do for this child. And at one point I have to let go and 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 in a way let God, right? So so this is the invitation, right? To to kind of enter that house, see, see things from that perspective. Uh, because yes, we ought to do, but there will always be at one point a limit to our doing. And then what? Right? So that's the idea. So I just wanted to say that because I I know it's a different uh, worldview and, and there has been pushback on this. So I wanted to clarify that. Okay, so today we are, of course, in the middle of the Jewish holidays. We have just finished Rosh Hashanah. We are entering Yom Kippur. And of course, in Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah it is traditional to study uh, the story of the Garden of Eden because, of course, traditionally, it has been said that Adam and Eve were created on Rosh Hashanah. I think I'm correct when I say this, right? So, of course, we're going to study uh, this, this story, but, of course, we're going to focus on Eve. And so what I want to do is look into, uh, a, a, give a slightly different perspective on the story than we're used to. Uh, in order to 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 decipher what we can learn, right, as women, right, from this from this particular story, so I want to. Can somebody read for me? Because my my Bible now, uh, I don't know where it is. <laughs> Actually, I, I have one. But does anyone have a have a text with you where you can read uh, the story of the temptation of Eve by the snake? Does anybody want to do that, or should I do it? Should I just do it? Or I can totally do it. <laughs> okay, so if you want to turn uh, with me, I'm going to, I have now become um, stuck with these glasses that I never had to wear, so <laughs> pretty um, distraught about that. <laughs> so I'm going to read here Genesis 3, and this is, of course, uh, the encounter between the serpent and Eve. Right. So it says this. Uh, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. 
he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. There's already so much, but <laughs> this text is so rich. So he continues, the snake, you will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes, and then we know the rest, right? Okay, so that's the story for now, <laughs> right? So I want to look actually in this story at the real, real problem here that is with Eve. Because the problem is not so much that she ate the fruit, right? The problem starts already before that. There is a shift in her perception of herself, which is then causing her to eat the fruit. And I believe if we can figure out this shift, then we can ourselves shift back <laughs> and it'll be much easier to stay away from transgression, right? So I wanna look at her mentality, how the snake artfully and cunningly shifts her mentality, her vision of herself, and then it becomes natural for her to, to take the fruit, right? So let's, let's look at where Eve is before the snake. Before the snake, Eve has everything. She is in complete abundance. She has sustenance. She has destiny, right? God has given her a calling. She can, you know, work the garden alongside Adam. She has everything she needs to survive in terms of food. She has a really good looking man in her life, right? This is Adam, right? So, I mean, she is somebody who is, is living in complete abundance. In that context, sin is not natural. Because sin, you cannot sin if you are in, if you have a mentality of abundance, right? And so this is what the snake first has to do. Before he can get her to sin, he has to create in her a sense of lack. Ah, uh, you know, when you eat the fruit, you will have all these things that you don't have right now, right? When you eat the fruit, you will become that thing that you have been forbidden to be. When you eat the fruit, you will receive all those things that you are lacking. What the snake really is doing here is opening up in her life and in her psyche a dimension of lack. And now Eve is thinking, huh, I don't have this. I want this. Why don't I have this? I want this. And I'm going to go get it. And so from the lack now, her, her, her gesture, her whole body shifts. She used to be just receiving the, the abundance, and now it turns to grasping, right? She turns, and, and the verb in the Hebrew is very strong, lakach, she takes the fruit. The lakach is very strong, why? Because it was only used once so far, and it was to describe the action of God who took Adam and put him in the garden, right? Lakach normally is a strong divine attribute, masterful divine attribute. She now has this same, uh, lakach, right? And she takes the fruit. And so I want to stop a little bit on that. I want to think about it a little bit because there is something here very profound when it comes to the 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 climate that produces sin right or transgression right you cannot sin or transgress or or do anything wrong if you are in abundance because you have everything and this is interesting sin stems from the moment you think i don't have this and i should have it right anytime you shift from a mentality of abundance to a mentality of lack you are on the path to criminal behavior, <laughs> right? I mean, if you look at the Ten Commandments, for example, most of the commandments have to do with somebody doing something because they're lacking something. They take the woman, they steal from the person, they lie, they covet, right? The root being, of course, to covet. So most of the commandments, when you look at them, um, and this is why, by the way, the commandment of the Sabbath is so important because the Sabbath is the remembrance of abundance. Uh, it's interesting, uh, just to do a side note, right? The Ten Commandments is written uh, very elegantly. The very center of it is actually the Sabbath. 
right? So you, you, this is, a, and this is a very important in ancient Near Eastern documents, they would write like this. The way they would write is they would put the main idea in the center, the key to the whole document would be in the center. So when you have the Sabbath in the center, the, the text is telling us here is the key to everything else. If you don't want to transgress or become criminal, you know, go out there and be um, transgressing or sinning. Remember the Sabbath. What does it mean? Remember the abundance, right? We'll come back to this, right? So, so it's very interesting that usually when we shift our mentality from, gra from, from abundance to lack, this is when we begin to fall wayward, right? On the wayside so and this is where eve is so so it's very interesting so so then she of course she then takes the fruit la carte very strong word and it's interesting she eats it and then she gives it to her husband this is on also another strong word natan to give which is also only given as is only ascribed to god when god gives the food in the garden of eden natan and now Eve, in a way, is taking over you can see how she is taking slowly over the position of god right? She's Lakach, right? She's Natan. And then she gives it to the husband who takes it and eats it. And that's a whole other story. <laughs> we will do the male bashing another time. <laughs> right? Today we focus on Eve, right? So, so you can see how Eve, what Eve is doing slowly, as she's shifting from abundance to lack, and she's shifting from receiving to grasping, she's also moving more and more into isolation, right? I mean, first thing we notice, she loses God, right? She loses God. Why? Because she has taken the place of God. <laughs> She's now the one doing the Natan and the Lakach, right? She has lost, in a way, herself, right? She has lost herself as a daughter of the Most High, as an heir to the abundance of the garden. She has, in losing the sense of abundance, she has lost herself as the daughter of God, as the one who is an heir, who is inheriting everything as a one who owns everything already. She's lost a sense of herself. And finally, she has become pro uh, profoundly uh, isolated from her husband, right, from Adam. And you can see that in the way that in a way they, they, there's the silence between them. The way that Adam silently eats the fruit is extremely eloquent because Adam is not somebody who is silent. He's somebody, he's very, very talkative. You see it the whole time when he first meets her, right? Ah, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Right? Adam is very uh, verbal. The silence of Adam here is, is, is very significant. The fact that he doesn't say anything and eats silently is saying that there's something deeply wrong in his mind and between them. They don't talk. In fact, when you look at this couple, they never talk. <laughs> right? I mean, the serpent is talking to Eve. God is talking to Adam. But together, they never talk. Even later they don't talk, right? So there is a rift, right, that occurs here between the husband and the wife. And now she finds herself, right, profoundly alone. And in a way, and, and she has lost in a way, not God only, not herself, not Adam, she has lost the Garden of Eden, right? Because when she has shifted from, I receive, I am in abundance, to grasping, I don't have enough, I have to take this fruit and get this and get that, she has lost Eden. Right. She has, in a way, expulsed herself from the garden. It's, God just, you know, officializes it. Right. But she's already way out. Right. She has already left the garden when she has shifted from receiving to grasping. She has already left the garden. Right. OK, so now we are in a big mess. <laughs> and of course, now God must step in. Right. So I want to look now at what God uh, is going to uh, tell her so i'm gonna go a little further genesis 3 still um get my amazing glasses back on okay so this is a, a very very uh, controversial passage right this is god of course addressing first the serpent then he addresses eve in the middle and then adam right notice eve is in the middle the key is there right uh and and of course he curses the serpent uh, he says a few words to even and and just this I mean just this passage is so so profound but I'm gonna just focus on a tiny section. So to Eve he says this. Um, so the translation is always off. When you read the Hebrew, it's actually this: I will greatly increase your pain and I will increase your conception. So it's not I will increase your pain in childbearing, like my translation says here. It says the real Hebrew actually says I will increase your pain and I will increase your conception. So I will increase your pain and I will increase your birth. 
it's, it's, so the two are together. It's interesting. We're going to see what that means. Uh, and then in pain, you will uh, give birth uh, to children. And then this last passage, your desire for your husband and he will rule over you. I'm going to carefully avoid today <laughs> because um, I, I'll tell you why. I'm working on this passage right now with a task force. <laughs> and there's going to be a conference about this passage where we will go very deeply into this passage, the, uh, your desire for a husband and he will rule over you and, and try to find a meaning from it that is not punitive, like most people have thought, but redemptive. So for now, I'll, put, I'll bracket that section because that is a, whoo, that's a, a whole new world, right? But I want to focus just on this passage. I will multiply your labor and your conception in pain, you will give birth to children. So before I, I, I throw the ball back in your court, I want to uh, make clear two things. Um, first of all, I want us to look at this passage, not as a punishment, not as a punitive moment, but as a redemptive moment, right? When God punishes, there's always a redeeming quality to it. God doesn't just crush us and be like, you know what, just suffer now so, <laughs> so you never do it again, right? No, no, no. The suffering is always very well chosen. God always chooses the kind of suffering that is necessary for the person to grow, right? So I want us to look at this, these words of God as redemptive. And I want us to ask ourselves, how are they redemptive? Right now, to be able to figure that out, we have to remember. Let's all remember together right now the sin, right? The sin of Eve is remember she has moved from receiving to grasping. And in doing so, she has isolated herself and has, in a way, expulsed herself from the garden. So now my question is, right? God is looking at her and thinking, right? The whole journey of Eve, how do I get her to journey back to who she was? Right, God is thinking that. How do I bring her back? How do I return her? Right, I, I hope you're seeing what I'm saying. The, the word return in Hebrew, remember, is teshuva, which is the same word as repentance. Right, so God is thinking about her repentance. How do I return her back to Eden? Right, so that's the goal of God. He's not just crushing her and throwing her out, you know, into the street. He's actually thinking, how do I return her? This is a beautiful moment, right? Because we always think we have to repent. But when you read the liturgy of the High Holidays, you see several times the, 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 the plea, right, of, of, of the worshipers, return us, right? It is God who returns us. So here, what God is trying to do is to return her back to Eden. And the way he's going to do that is by multiplying her pain and multiplying her conception. So I want to start with the first question to you guys. How is pain redemptive? And how is the pain she's now given going to help her move back into the Garden of Eden? So this is a crazy question, right? What I'm saying is that pain in a way is a gateway back to Eden. How? <laughs> right? We think pain is moving us away from Eden. But God in a way, the text I believe is God is using pain, I believe, to steer Eve back into the Garden of Eden. So that's the, 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 the riddle I'm giving you. So I'm curious, can anyone tell me how, well, maybe we can start there. How do you think that pain can be redemptive, right? Yes, pain sucks and pain, <laughs> but, but is there a way that pain can be redemptive? Yes, uh, Feldman, go ahead. Um, it's very interesting that you mentioned that because one of the things I always say to people when they're going through that, you know, something really tough. My hope for you is that you'll grow from this. Okay. So in order to change, we have to feel it inside us, the, 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 the pain, in order to grow and react to it and say, I have to change because things, pain will remain the same unless I change. I know what you say, because we just finished studying the book of Job in, in one of my classes. And in the book of Job, the pain is so intense that Job is reduced to dust and ashes. And I don't know if any of you have experienced pain at that level, where you are like dust and ashes. Everything has been taken away from you and you are just nothing left, right? At that moment, you have the, the beautiful uh, discourse of God 
where he tells Job, stand up, right? It's a powerful word, stand up. This is an allusion to a kind of resurrection, right? Um, so what, what, what the book of Job teaches me is that pain is in a way, it, it, it brings, it completely destroys you, decreates you so that a new you can emerge, right? This is what we learn. This is one of the main lessons in my view of the book of Job is that pain in a way is the, are the birth pangs of our rebirth. A lot of the pain we go through can become actually simple birth pangs for our birth, right? As a new person. So, and Job does emerge and maybe maybe we'll study Job together at some point, but Job does emerge a transformed man at the end of the, the ordeal, right? So absolutely, so definitely pain decreates so that we can be recreated, right? So um, very nice, I like, I like that very much. Um, Anybody else want to say anything about pain, about how it might bring her back to uh, Eden? Uh, yes, Linda. She's muted. Yeah, see, she's trying to. <laughs> Who are we trying? Linda, you want me to unmute you? Can you do it? I just did. Okay. Um, I, I think one of the things I was going to say is that without pain, you don't appreciate. In other words, there has to be, a, you know, a dichotomy to be able to understand that there's both. Oh, this is good. You bring us closest to Eden, right? Because without pain, we cannot appreciate the gifts, right? But so I didn't know that they were let back in the garden i thought oh, that was it no they're not but he's trying to steer her back at least and uh, 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 just uh, we'll see we'll see how he doesn't bring okay. the <laughs> like <laughs> concretely materially in the garden but he shifts the mindset back to the mindset of eden yes thank you for that clarification right it's not that he's going to bring her back into the garden per se but he's going to shift her mentality to the garden of eden mentality which is the mentality of abundance right that's what I mean by going back to Eden is going back to the mentality of abundance, which, which in a way, uh, keeps you uh, from transgressing, right? Okay. Uh, now, notice this. I want to go a little further, right? Pain. Uh, I, I would. I, well, I will. I will add actually <laughs> to what you both said, right? How I have experienced pain is always as a complete loss of control of my life, right? I had this agenda. I wanted this to happen, and boom, didn't happen, <laughs> right? Um, and so now I'm here with nothing, everything, right? So I've always, uh, pain has always thrown me back um, on my own helplessness. And it's not a pleasant experience for me because I'm an, L and I'm an alpha female, right? I am extremely uh, in ambitious and, and driven, right? So I, 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 I will make it happen, right? If, if there's something that needs to happen, I will make it happen. This is the mentality, right? And to be against the wall like this for me, has been very difficult uh, the, it, it, to discover my sense of helplessness, right? Has been extremely difficult. And, and so it's interesting that in the text, now moving a little further, and we'll see why the sense of helplessness is good, right? We're gonna see that in a second. Um, notice that the, the multiplication of pain is juxtaposed to the multiplication of conception. In other words, at the point of my fruitfulness, as a woman, my conceptions, at the point of my fruitfulness, pain, right? So now I'm going, I'm going deeper into the text, right? So I want to look at this. Why is it that God chooses to, to strike my fruitfulness with pain mm -hmm. or limitation? Right now, I want to I want to give you the big picture because this is the not the first time this happens. Of course, this is the first time it happens, but it continues to happen. Throughout the book of Genesis, I want you to take a look at the matriarchs. All of the matriarchs, to a certain degree, struggled with fruitfulness. They were barren, pain at the point of their fruitfulness, right? And so the, the matriarchs really struggled. They, they had this over, you know, very powerful urge to create, to, 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 to give birth. And each time, pa! It was taken away and they were barren, right? So here you have a continuation of the story of Eve, right? Uh, the same with man, but more symbolically, right? I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but circumcision is pain at the point of the man's fruitfulness, right? It is a limitation placed on the fruitfulness of man. So you have this, this kind of um, uh, atmosphere in the, in the book of Genesis 
which is a continuation of this story, where pain is, is strikes us, both men and women, at the very point where we want the most to act, <laughs> right? At the very point of our fruitfulness. And so here's my question now. Why is it that over and over again, starting with Eve and continuing with the matriarchs throughout the Hebrew Bible, you have us as women struggling with pain at the point of our fruitfulness. Why is it that God strikes us, limits us at the point where we want to be the most powerful? <laughs> right. This is the point of our power, fruitfulness, the womb. This is my seat of my power, right? Boom, <laughs> barren, right? So I want to ask you a little bit, why is God doing that? All right, I see a couple hands. I was seeing uh, Roya and Roya. then- Roya, please, she was up. Uh -huh. You have to unmute Roya. Yes, uh, she is. So I just want to complete what the other lady said, and thank you, Abby, for all the information. So, as we know, our soul is uh, covered by the shells. We have a different clipper. And when you put the seed in the ground, it's not going to grow the root until the shell broken. Yes, 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 yes. So, with each pain that we bear, we broke one of those shells, and we come closer to God. And our, our understanding is going to grow. And we feel more joy. So when you have a pain after the, giving the birth, when they give, put the child in your hand, everything vanishes. Mm -hmm. And the easiness of having that baby and the love that comes through that pain not only grow to us, also make us closer to Hashem and also be thankful to what's happening to us. And this is part of the growing, as Cindy mentioned that. Wow, that's beautiful. I love the mystical interpretation you're giving, right? The klipot. We are all, in a way, caught in the klipot, right? And, and this is keeping the light from coming out and from coming in. And so the pain is, I, I love this mystical interpretation, is there to break open our klipot so that the light can be released in our lives, right? And that's a beautiful image and it works very well here, right? Uh, Cindy, did you wanna add? Um, if you would be kind enough to repeat the question because I was still focused <laughs> on, on Roya. So, so God hits us at the seat of our power, the womb, right? The womb is my power as a woman. This is the, the moment where I can create like God, right? <laughs> This is the most powerful place in my body, right? And God chooses to hit me right there and limit me right there. And, and he does the same with Eve. I'm just a continuation of this, right? So why do you think that God chooses to limit us precisely in the, in the point of our bodies where we are the most powerful? What is the meaning of this? What is the teaching? What is the redemptive moment of this? And you will- well, I, I, I think it's also to remind us that we're not God. And the only one who can really create is God. And God will grant it to us when we have grown enough to accept the responsibility the way God does. Okay, I, I love it. I love it because you have anticipated everything I was going to say. It's very <laughs> nice. <laughs> People just bring you naturally where you want to go. <laughs> exactly, right? I, I, I will add to that. Why God hits us at the seat of our power? So that when we feel that profound limitation, when we feel there's no way forward, we might look up, right? If we were fully empowered to do everything like God, why we need God? <laughs> right? I, I'm a goddess now, right? I can do it myself, right? So God precisely will limit us over and over again, will, will, will stop us in our tracks, will, will, will wall us, fence us in, will help us hit against the wall. Why? So that at one point, when we find the limit of our action is the only moment when we will look up and, and, and that at that moment, there can enter the dimension of grace, right? So it, it's very powerful. I, I, I quoted this text the last time I, I taught this. Um, there's David, of course, who is running away from, from Saul. And he, he says in one of the Psalms, he says, I look up, right? Uh, 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 I think it's, he's surrounded by mountains, right? Ah, how is the text? Somebody who knows this better than me. Uh, I look to the mountains, right? From where does my help come, right? So he is surrounded. The mountains is the symbol of I am surrounded. I am stuck and there's no way out. From where, where does my help come from? And then immediately my help comes from the Lord, right? So 
I, this is where, and this is a somewhat, I've, I'm starting to realize this. This is a, it seems like a new concept in the context when I'm teaching this. I, I, I use, people are, are always kind of um, <laughs> a, um, surprised, right? Because we are not used to this, that at the point of where my action ends, God's action can begin, right? And this is, I believe, the teaching of the matriarchs who were barren, right? When the matriarchs realize I'm stuck at the point where I am the most powerful and I need to get unstuck, at that moment, they have no choice but to open up to grace, right? And so what happens there? When we are in pain, when we are stuck at the seat of our power is when we can finally look up right and and receive in a way where my action stops is the point where god's action begins right and this is why each time it is god who gives the child over and over again the emphasis is made god gives the child not you <laughs> yeah yeah it's natural but in the text god on purpose closes the womb so that the lesson can come across that i am the one who gives you everything right and so this is so so interesting because what we're noticing now is that through this pain and this limitation, we open up back to the sense of, I can only receive, I cannot grasp, I cannot make this happen, I am stuck. At that moment, please God, <laughs> help me, <laughs> right? At that moment, we shift back into the receptive mentality of Eden. That's what I meant, Linda, by the return to Eden. At that moment, we are back into the mentality of, Everything comes from you. I am, grant me this, right? And at that moment, yes, we're not in Eden, but our mind is in Eden. <laughs> our mentality is in Eden. Does that make sense? We shift back to a mentality of abundance. It is all to be given to me, right? I will wait until it is given to me. I don't have to grasp for it. I, I don't have to feel the lack because it will be given in its time and in its way, right? In God's time and in God's way. So that's how God steers Eve and us, her daughters, back to Eden. Because if we did not have the pain, we would remain stuck. I love it what Roya said. We will remain stuck in the clipot of grasping. <laughs> right. We will continue to think, ah, I have to make it happen. I have to push. I have to strive. I have to grasp. I have to take. Right. And we will never make it back as long as we're like this. Right. And so God pop, interrupts us. And now ah, I have to <laughs> I have to I have to beg <laughs> right, to get the thing I need. And at that moment where my hands move from here to here, grasping to receiving at that moment, I am back into Eden and I have made Teshuvah. That is the truth right. of Teshuvah. Teshuvah is not just return. Return to what? We don't even know. We say it like that. Return to Eden. Teshuvah is return to the mentality of Eden. When I make Teshuvah, I move from everything is in my control to I need to surrender and allow God to bring this into my life. I need to move from a mentality of lack to a mentality of abundance. That is the return of Teshuvah. That's I, very good. Yeah. I read, and at the same time, I return to myself as an heir to God, right? I am a, I am the heir of God. I'm the daughter of the Most High. I, why am I grasping? <laughs> Everything is mine. <laughs> My father owns the universe. Why am I grasping? Right? At that moment, we remember who we are. And that is the true Teshuvah, right? And so that's what I wanted to share with you. And now I, I guess we have some time for questions or, or going further or deeper. If you have any comments or things you want to add or, or anything you want to clarify, the floor is yours. <laughs> uh -huh. Interesting. Uh -huh. Very good. Uh -huh. Okay, so this reminds me a lot of what you experience what with addiction and mm -hmm. um returning you know like you you let go and you surrender and you let recognize go. that you're powerless and at that point you can begin to to grow and open and start to see you know start to reach for help and to you, you used an expression that is def definitely in every AA meeting, you know, like to let, to, 
to let God or, you know, whatever. The go and let God. <laughs> go and let God. Right. So um, it's so basic and so central, I think, to our existence and experience in life. Um, and it, it it just all comes full circle and it, it helps me to see the Jewish part of that. Cause when you go into those meetings, it's usually Christian mm -hmm. and um, it's, it's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you. You totally got it. <laughs> One person got it. <laughs> right? and so it's exactly that in the AA meeting, they're told I have, they have to acknowledge that they have reached a place which is out of control, right? As long as they're in control, I got my addiction down, I'm good, I can control it. They can't do this. They have to admit a loss of control. And, and only then, right, does grace flow in to and an, an, an AA meeting, of course, is the idea that God, right, moves and then takes control of the addiction for you, right? So, of course, yes, we see this as Christian, but you're where they got it from, from here. <laughs> right? so, so, the, so, so absolutely, thank you. It does give us a Jewish perspective on those AA meetings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. That, that's exactly it. You, you totally got it. <laughs> yes, uh, Miriam. Um, I think that it's a way of teaching humility, you know, that um, if, if uh, we give birth, um, but we have to acknowledge that, you know, God had a role in it, um, that that's part of, you know, that's part of um, being humble. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Until we go back to, see, Eve wanted to be like God, right? And we want to be like God. <laughs> we want to make it happen and control and create, right? The moment we go back to our humanity, I love the way you put it. Humility actually in, in Latin comes from the word humus, which means earth, right? So recognizing that we're earthware, we are not, you know, silverware, we are earthware. And as soon as we turn back to our humanity and to the to our create, to the fact that we're creatures, right, from the earth at that moment, right, the creator can step in, of course, right? So I, I love that. Absolutely. Yes. Humility to recognize that we are in a partnership with, with God, right? It's not just me that has to do everything. God can step in right and and take control when i'm limited right yes beautiful thank you you're welcome i also found it interesting that you know like i the story of the birth of isaac and that she had to wait until it was almost an impossibility <laughs> to have a child well it was an impossibility in uh -huh. today's world to have a child at you know, when you're almost a hundred or you're in your hundreds, whatever it is. And the fact that she had, she herself had to laugh. And that's why, you know, Isaac laughed her because it was so ridiculous and it could not have happened, but for the hand of God. Exactly. Right. Another Jewish example of limitation and grace. Right. Um, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and and God will mess with you like that. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. I oh, mean, it's boy. like he's, he's very playful in a way. I mean, we could take it with a smile. You know, <laughs> like, he's playing with me. Right. He's, he's pushing me to my limits, you know, just so I can see. Right. All all, you know, everything he can do with that. So, yes. Beautiful. Thank you. I love that. Yes, anyone. I, I understand what you're saying, and it, it's a wonderful way of looking at the transition. What I'm not seeing is where Eve got it. Eve I understand where, where Eve got it, where she actually understood and mm -hmm. and moved back. That that little piece. I see what he's trying to do. I'm not. I don't see where she's learned it and has moved forward. I think it's us as her daughters who can bring her back. You see what I mean? She, it's too early for her, right? But And so God continues to teach the same lesson to the matriarchs, and slowly they learn, right? Um, and Sarah, Rebecca, right, Ra Rachel. So I think Eve is still being redeemed through us. We are her daughters. We carry her with us. And and no, she certainly didn't make it. <laughs> but we can make it, right? <laughs> So we we carry her her legacy, right? And and the matriarchs are really the it, it's really a redemption of Eve. Yet each time a matriarch gives birth in a way that's crazy, 
that's a, a redeeming moment. And, and each time the matriarch realizes God gives, right, not me, this is a Eve being redeemed. So yes, I God is starting to try to shift Eve, but he has to continue to shift her through us all the way now to the 21st century. He's trying to bring Eve back, us, right, her daughters back to Eden. <laughs> yes, Cindy. There was something else that really struck me because on Rosh Chodesh, we usually sing the Hallel, Hallel prayer. And it always strikes me as it's part of that prayer. It says, God settles a barren woman in her home as a mother happy with children. Hallelujah. And to me, that's just at the center. It's giving you a hint that's at the center of this and the gratitude and the immense gratitude that you feel. And gratitude is really, I think, getting back to returning to Eden, right? I love it's, that. I love that it's in the Halel, right? Where you're being yeah. grateful because gratitude is a way to shift back already in the mentality of abundance before getting the abundance, right? right. Gratitude, you get back in that state of receptivity and things begin to flow. I was studying Kabbalah at one point with some people and, and one of the lessons that they were giving us was it's, it's it, when you're grateful, in a way what you're doing is opening up for more abundance, right? The gratefulness in a way creates space. Whereas when you're lacking, it's like, right? So there's so the, the, the gratefulness in a way is a way to go back to Eden, to be in a state of abundance. And then of course, everything will come to us like it did in Eden, right? So, so gratefulness can be a way to attract God in, in our lives, attract the providence of God, right? Absolutely. So I love that. Yes, absolutely. And in the Hallel, did you did you say that that verse was in the middle of the Hallel or? It's, um, it's Psalm 1, 111. And it's, uh, I would say at the beginning, it's on page 50 of our of our Sidor. I'll, I'll look at it. Yeah, that's interesting. I will look at it. I'm curious now. <laughs> I'm going to explore it later. Thanks. Psalm 11, uh, 111, right? 111. Yes, yeah, Psalm 111. I, I will take a look. Thank you. Yeah. And yes, uh, Linda. I think you also have to realize that each person has to go through this. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's why you read the Torah. That's why the repetition, and you will always get something, but everyone has to get it. Yeah. At their own yeah. time. Yeah. You can't teach this stuff. Right. It's right. it's experience. That's the wisdom, yeah. right? That you were <laughs> referring to. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting the way you just said it. It's funny, I ask my students sometimes, why does God introduce himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Why the three names? <laughs> Why is that enough? I am God, right? So one of the lessons, right, is that God is the God of each individual in a particular way, right? So everyone in a way has a specific journey to make, like you're saying, with God. And every woman has to get to that point of barrenness. It, it doesn't have to be physical barrenness. It can be intellectual barrenness, emotional barrenness, where you're like at a dead end. <laughs> and then see the open that occurs right that that can occur at that moment so and you're right it's a very individual journey and the matriarchs our matriarchs pave the way right for us we can we can walk in their footsteps yeah absolutely and i love that each of the matriarchs are so imperfect <laughs> yes we feel so much better <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the biblical text, unlike the Greek tragedies, is not a, a text of heroes, right? It's a text of uh, kind of losers, you know, a lot of losers. So the matriarchs, <laughs> they have problems. Yes, yeah. And, and But, you know, that's like Leonard Cohen said, right? That's the crack where the light comes in, right? Because they're so human. That is why God is so moving so powerfully in their lives, because they're so profoundly human, right? We are, in the in the Hebrew tradition, it is our humanity that is the path to God. We are not supposed mm -hmm. to raise to rise above our humanity to become, you know, spiritual. Right. As we connect to our brokenness, to our humanity, to our limitation, that God can begin to powerfully move in our lives. So that's that's the lessons of the Hebrew Bible, definitely. Yeah, yeah, we're not the, heroes. <laughs> the patriarchs are uh, imperfect as well. Yes, so it's not just the matriarchs. <laughs> 
I, I am very, very, very curious to know what you move on to in that next interpretation because that is a very disturbing. I know, um, but we are, we are, we have so much. Like it's gonna be, I don't know. We have so much good stuff coming out of that. We are going to break the glass ceiling on this interpretation. You guys should come. I'm gonna live stream it. It's gonna be in the spring. I'm yep. gonna try to invite like top scholars in the field, and we're gonna look at this text, and we're going to completely reimagine it, <laughs> right? Based on the text, we're not gonna move away from the text, but I'll just give you a preview. Uh, I believe this text has been read through an Aristotelian lens, through a Greek lens. And the church fathers and the rabbis have, in a way, informed by Greek thought, have misread the text. But when mm -hmm. you read the text in connection to other texts in the Hebrew Bible, or even in connection to the right that where it is, the, the, the words of God in general, you discover very, very different things, a very different interpretation, one which is redemptive and even messianic. So there's, there's, it's there. It's, we're not going to invent this. It's there. There's a completely different way to read this. And the reason it's been misread is because people have looked at it through the Greek lens of misogyny uh, and have immediately interpreted it in miso misogynistic uh, is it, uh, terms. Yeah, there is. <laughs> yeah. We have to look well, at I, I, Are you going to have this at the college or are you doing uh, it on and your You're own? helping, by the way, Pearl. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it will be at the college in the spring. That's I think that's what Arne was telling you about. Right. Yes, that's that's the one. Yes. And I will live stream it. And you guys are you can come in person or you can come on the live stream. We are going to tear this this text apart and put oh. it back in a way that's beautiful and honoring of woman. <laughs> and when is that? Yes. What? But when is that going to be? Have you said have a, an idea? Year. For sure in the spring semester, but I have to ask the okay. When they can make it, I'm I'm emailing them right now. Yeah, and, and please share the date with us, and we'll definitely put it on our calendars. That would be you'll know, know. <laughs> you'll know. That would be wonderful. I'm leaving that as a kind of um, what do you call it? I have just teased you with this. Yes, <laughs> a teaser. A teaser, yes. <laughs> I will just see if there are any more pressing or any more questions. Just a little feedback. I, I for me, um, I thought that that what you shared with us was, of course, we're in Tishrei, and that's why this was particularly spoken about. But at this time, when we're all trying to be a bit reflective about who we are and and take that step back, and and to use Miriam's word, to be a little humble, and to realize that we do not control. Um, as much as we think we do and as, you know, we feel secure and where we're going, whether it's professionally, within our families, within everything that we do, the truth is that we really are not in control. And we never know when we wake up tomorrow what the world is going to bring to us. Um, and to remember that there are forces greater um, than who we are. Um, it's a wonderful reminder, and particularly looking at it through the eyes of Eve, who um, in my experience, has, has historically gotten a very bad rap. Um, <laughs> she um, disobeyed him. <laughs> she gave that and he's she, relaxed to her. <laughs> she did. Eve is evil. We are evil. Woman is evil. Um, that is blame the snake. Come on. Blame, blame, get the snake. Get the snake. Um, no, really. I, 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 in, personally, I thank you. Um, it really is... <laughs> Um, it's difficult sometimes when you're in shul like 27,000 hours within um, three weeks to, um, no, to to keep that spiritual connection um, and to really realize that you're you're there to open your hands um, and to say, you know, give me, I need you um, and you have control and, and I don't. Um, so that's, to me, that was a wonderful um, addition to everything that's going on right now. Um, so I want to thank you very, very much. I really do. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll invite you back again. <laughs> to, uh, yeah. no. No, Abby, no. I just wanted to ask you, if people want to, to audit your one of your classes on campus, do they, can they do so? Um, or any, is anything live streamed or Zoomed or they have to come in person or can they get um, a list of the classes you teach if they want to look into it? Yeah, I mean, um, 
you can, as far as I'm concerned, you can just show up and sit in the classroom. <laughs> okay. You don't even have to go through the proper channels, right? No, nobody's going to notice. So, yeah, I can give you, I can send Wendy the schedule and the room numbers and everything. I'd be happy to pass it on. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, did you guys, I mean, I'm open to a Zoom option, like where you would just listen in. I could put my computer there and just, you know, okay. put it on. <laughs> So that might be a possibility. If you're interested, I could. Yeah. I think something that I think we should look into. I mean, I think that that's yeah. a wonderful option for some people that are not able to drive or get there, or there are other things. And maybe right. Um, right. even if, you know, if you're working to be able to, to take an hour out to listen, as opposed to what becomes a three hour um, situation to drive and come back would be great. Um, but maybe perhaps we can discuss it offline and see what the best way is to work it. And I'd be, delighted to pass it on um, yeah it would be a possibility because i usually record my classes anyways i like to put them on youtube so um, nice oh, that's I, a great yeah, option yeah i wouldn't be able to like pay too much attention to you that's fine that's fine <laughs> yeah. all right because i'd be in the classroom kind of you know projecting out there but you could totally listen in <laughs> but you, you you've just taught us we have to open our hands hands and receive <laughs> we don't have to grab we have to okay, receive great. your what so, you're sharing yeah, with us let's talk about that option i'm open to it yeah okay great we will we'll follow yeah. up on it i also want to mention that um something else that occurred to me like when i think of pain i think of it as an opportunity instead of looking at it as bad i always see what could come out of that there's something there for me why is hashem you know why is god giving me this pain so there's a beautiful poem by Rumi, who is a Sufi poet from the Muslim tradition. And he says that pain is like divine medicine, right? It's supposed to heal something, actually, paradoxically. So it's a medicine he gives us. It tastes bitter, but it's it's going to heal us from, I guess, the kipot that Roya was talking about, right? So yeah, I, I love that. Yes, that, that's, that fits. Yep. I would like to thank you again for joining us and thank everybody who is with us and wish, every, I wish everybody Gamar Tov. May we all be sealed yes. for a good, healthy, wonderful, peaceful year and let the world come with us because I think it can use a lot of healing right now too on, on every, every level. Amen. 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 Thank, thank you all. all right. I will, um, and thank, thank you. you so much, Abby. I this brings me back to my days. I was a religion major, so I enjoy this stuff a lot. <laughs> thank. And by the way, you don't have to get the camera changed. You look beautiful in the amber. <laughs> very nice. Don't worry about the camera. Really. Okay. All right. Thank right. you, one and all. Kind and of the cabaret coloring. It's great, <laughs> right? right? It's really. <laughs> It's a mood. It's a right. mood color. It's very, very nice. <laughs> All um, right. I hope to see some of you in, you in Temple this weekend and everybody else. A good year. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, thank thank you. you again, Abby. Good thank night, you. everybody. Thank you.